We start off the afternoon with a bang and a keynote address. Uh, here to introduce our, our guest speaker is Jim Gilmore, who's director of public affairs. He says that means a lobbyist at uh, at sea processors and he is a long time what fixture on the hill and otherwise and jim thank you so much for participating very much participating on the steering committee well thank you dave um yeah i uh, have been around the fish block a few times and so <laughs> was a little um depressing sitting through the morning which was almost like having a photo album of every car crash, em <laughs> emergency surgery, and everything else that has happened to you over your, over your life. So, um, uh, but others are are lucky. They've they've had more of kind of a hit and hit and run kind of uh, a relationship here with fisheries. And um, so, for, and for those of you who were frightened to hear a keynote speaker and see me standing there, um, <laughs> immediate assurance is that uh, it's not me. So. Um, but I do have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Congressman Doc Hastings, who uh, came to Congress back in uh, 1994. And your political uh, trivia uh, answer for the day is that he defeated uh, then freshman Congressman Jay Inslee uh, to get his seat in Congress. And I don't know what happened to Inslee, but um, <laughs> some, I, don't, I don't keep up much with politics in, in my job. so. Uh, so Congressman Hastings represents the fourth uh, congressional district, so he's got the Tri-Cities and, uh, uh, and Yakima over in, in his area there. He did cede a little bit of ground to Congressman Reichert in the last uh, redistricting there. Um, and uh, since 2011, uh, Congressman Hastings has been the chair of the Natural Resources Committee, which, as uh, Gene Flemma said uh, full-throatedly today, also has something to do with Magnuson-Stevens Act. It's not just a Senate Commerce thing, which as a former Senate Commerce Committee staffer, we could debate um, later. But, um, uh, but we've been lucky since, uh, uh, had a, uh, have known Congressman Hastings for a long time. And one thing that I think he knows is that while not a lot of our uh, vessels dock in his, uh, no pun intended, in his district, <laughs> Um, that uh, we do have quite an economic impact over on that side of the state. There's uh, a lot of seasonal employment in fisheries, uh, which complements uh, agriculture. And I remember when uh, Sid Morrison was representing that district, um, we went in with a, n a number of uh, crew members from our vessels and uh, sat down. The first thing that um, <coughs> the skipper of one of our boats noted was that he, uh, Congressman uh, Morrison had a, a box of apples from New Zealand behind his desk. <laughs> and the uh, skipper of the boat was an orchardist uh, when he wasn't uh, out on the vessel. And so uh, we talked a little bit about that. Um, but uh, Congressman Morrison then said, I'm so excited to meet you people because this is all new money that you're bringing into the district. You're not recycling this money. It's new money. So uh, we do have that effect throughout um, Washington State in this industry. And that's why we've uh, been able to look to uh, Congressman Hastings here during his chairmanship uh, to support the, uh, the seafood industry. Obviously, catch shares has been uh, a staple of the way we've done management out here, uh, but is not uniformly popular throughout the nation, as some of you might have heard. Um, and so we've been uh, fortunate to have uh, Congressman Hastings uh, on the job and, and uh, defending us uh, and keeping our catch share programs uh, safe. But <laughs> with some sadness, and it was alluded to this morning, I think, um, uh, Congressman Hastings has decided, and this is just incomprehensible to me, uh, that he doesn't want to fly back to Washington, D.C. every weekend, um, and that uh, he is going to retire uh, at, the, at the end of this term. Uh, so uh, we'll see whether or not the uh, Magnuson Act is one of his uh, signature accomplishments as he leaves. But... Um, for now, we'll just look forward to uh, his perspectives and see what happens. But please welcome Congressman Doc Hastings. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jim, thank you very much. And uh, I'm told that this turns on automatically, so I hope that it, uh, the automatic part is working here. If you can hear me, then that means it is, it is working well. Well, thank you very much for uh, having me here to discuss the uh, Magnuson-Stevens Act. Uh, Act. 
and uh, our current efforts in Congress to uh, update and modernize that act, and I want to emphasize that update and modernize. Uh, as Jim mentioned, I have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, and we have jurisdiction over all issues pertaining to fisheries, wildlife, and others. And as you all well know, the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, that's its official title, which is of course more popularly known as, as Magnuson-Stevens, is the primary statute governing fishing activities in federal waters. And you also know that that act expired at the end of the fiscal year 2013. Now the Magnuson-Stevens Act is as much about managing fishermen as it is about managing fish. And both, I must say, is a challenge. It requires a balancing act in a number of areas between a sustainable harvest level and the maximum economic value for fisheries, between recreational and commercial users of the same resource, between different gear types in the same fisheries, and between issues in different states of our union. In addition, not only are the fisheries different, but the challenges are different in each region of the country. And because of these differences, a one-size-fits-all management structure is not the most efficient structure. Now, while the Magnuson-Stevens Act is a national law, it does delegate an amazing amount of decision-making to the regions and to the stakeholders uh, throughout, uh, throughout the country in the form of the regional uh, fishery management councils. These councils allow the states and the people who are affected by the fishery management plans to use their expertise and on the water knowledge of the fisheries to create management plans that are reasonable, effective, and enforceable. That's obviously the goal of what Magnuson Stevens is all about. The Act provides a broad framework for allowing each region to react to its own challenges and its own conditions. I think this is a key part of the Act and it's one part that we must maintain while updating this important law. Now since 2011, uh, we have had nine full committee or subcommittee hearings uh, on either the reauthorization of the Act or federal fisheries management issues. We've had that many hearings uh, in my House Natural Resources Committee. In addition to that, the eight regional fishery management councils hosted the third Managing Our Nation's Fisheries Conference earlier this year, and that conference focused specifically on reauthorization issues. Each of the eight councils submitted a list of what works in their region, what doesn't work in their region, and what changes they would like to see in the Act. That conference then resulted in 128 findings, and many of these were recommendations on how to legislatively improve the Act. In addition to that conference, the National Academy of Science also released a report detailing additional recommendations on the rebuilding provisions of the Act. Now all of those recommendations, in addition to separate meetings with representatives, individual representatives of the councils of states, commercial and recreational fishermen, and non-governmental organizations, all of this was reviewed and that information guided us in developing the draft legislation that we released last December. This bill, uh, that, the drafted bill, and the title of that bill, by the way, is Strengthening Fishing Communities and Increasing Flexibility in Fisheries Management Act. That's even longer than the original Magnus and Stephen, but we thought that would be appropriate. Uh, we, we, that, that draft that we put together, we think will have some common sense reforms, uh, and those reforms will promote, we think, increased flexibility and transparency, will improve data collection, uh, as a result will create jobs and give predictability and certainty to the coastal communities that depend on a stable fishing economy. In the hearings that we have held, there is a general agreement that the act is working. I think that's an important point. We've heard that over and over. I have said all along that I believe that the act is fundamentally sound. It has enabled the United States to have the best managed fisheries in the world and has been instrumental in providing a framework for allowing regions, as I alluded to earlier on, to address their own unique challenges. But 
Success does not mean the act works perfectly or should not be modified or improved. That should be self-evident. Many fishermen and coastal communities that depend on healthy fisheries are currently facing challenges, including severe cuts to quotas, rising costs, and restrictive fishing seasons. Let me give you a few of, uh, examples of this. The Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council just reduced the 2014 recreational fishing season for the red snapper to just 11 days. I don't have to tell you that this is an important species for recreational fishery in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is especially frustrating to those fishermen in the Gulf and the fishery managers down there because at the same time that the seasons are getting shorter, fishery sciences uh, scientists are reporting large increases in the red snapper biomass. For red snapper fishermen in the South Atlantic, farther to the east, the red snapper fishery has been closed since 2010 with just the exception of a handful of days where fishing was allowed. Another example is in New England. In 2013, fishermen faced a 61% reduction in the George's Bank cod and 78% uh, reduction in the Gulf of Maine cod catch limits. Now, these examples of restrictions would be hard for almost any business uh, to survive with cuts that large. Yet for regions where entire communities rely to a large extent on fishing activities, this can be very, very devastating to their economies. While we hear, continue to hear that the act is fundamentally sound, we have also heard at almost every hearing that the balance between preventing overfishing and optimizing the yield from our fisheries has become unbalanced and that additional flexibility for fisheries managers should be considered. I believe that there are updates to the law that could be considered that will address these concerns and ensure the proper balance between the bi biological needs of fish and the economic needs of fishermen. In my discussion with uh, fishermen and managers here from the west, uh, west Coast, western part of the United States, I am told that there is really no need for ma major changes in the Act, but that there are some areas where the Act could be improved to make the management process work better. Now that is certainly not, I want to emphasize, not the view of other regions in the country. And some, for example, are calling for significant changes, such as exempting entire fisheries from the Magnuson-Stevens Act. As I mentioned earlier, the management of the red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico has become increasingly difficult. In order, and, and this is an important point, in order to get this reauthorization passed, we must find some solutions to the science and management problems of that fishery. And, I mentioned New England earlier, we must find ways to help fishermen and those communities that rely on, on fishing uh, ec economies some relief for them too. If we don't, we simply in a political process don't have the votes. However, we cannot fix those problems by enacting provisions that will cause new problems in other regions. That's the nature of a, all of a national act, is you have those things that you've got to balance up. So I'm hoping that we can maintain what works well for the West Coast while finding solutions to the problems facing the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico. In the Gulf, I believe the lack of sound science may be the main problem facing that fishery. While better science may be the eventual answer, it certainly is not a short-term fix, it's a long-term fix. This represents an additional balancing act we are trying to address in this reauthorization. How to get better information in the regions where the data is poor while maintaining the level of surveys and stock assessments that has allowed the West Coast to be one of the most productive fishery regions in the world. The trick in a time when federal funding is stagnant at best is to maintain the financial resources in the regions where the fisheries are healthy and productive while finding new sources of funding for other regions. It's important that we continue to fund the current level of data collection here on the West Coast and not rob Peter to pay Paul to satisfy some other concerns. Doing that, I think, would cause our West Coast fisheries to suffer. Now, one promising tool for collecting additional data from fishermen is through the use of new technologies. New technologies are changing uh, uh, virtually all industries in the country, so that should be evident also in this uh, case. 
Vessel monitoring systems are already in use in many fisheries, and the use of camera technology is being tested in a number of regions in the country. In addition, an app for iPhones has been developed to gather real, better real-time information for recreational fisheries uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. While these technologies all show promise for gathering more and better data, some managers have been slow to embrace these new technologies. The draft legislation that we circulated attempted to legislatively encourage the use of electronic monitoring, and we have received a significant number of comments on this particular provision. All the input that we received on that provision in the draft bill has helped us make substantial progress, I think, to making it better than what the original draft was. In addition to data collection, the draft legislation provides the councils with more flexibility in how they rebuild their fisheries, and it provides councils with the flexibility on how they can set annual catch limits. But, and this is an important point, it does not eliminate those requirements. This discussion draft that we circulated maintains the requirement to stop overfishing. It maintains the requirement to set or to rebuild overfish fisheries. And it maintains the requirement to set annual catch limits. But it provides more flexibility for better local decisions to achieve these goals. Now, there are some things that we cannot change with this legislation. And I speak of some outside groups that do not support any economic activities that involve the harvest and human use of our natural resources. And that includes fishing. Unfortunately, uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act does not exist in a vacuum. Sometimes we wish it would were. A number of other statutes affect how fisheries are managed. Let me name a few. The Endangered Species Act, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, the Antiquities Act, as well as executive orders coming from the executive branch like the National Olson Policy. They can all be used to make fisheries management much more difficult. And these groups that I alluded to earlier have become very adept at using all of these laws to restrict fishing activities in the United States. While the United States has the most rigid fishery management measures in the world, and that is primarily, by the way, because of Magnuson-Stevens, that does not seem to be good enough for some of these groups. And I find it kind of ironic that when these groups attack U.S. fisheries in an attempt to impose even stricter management regimes, the result is, is that we import much more of our seafood from foreign countries which do not have the same rigid management measures as we do here in the United States. We are now importing more than 90% of the seafood consumed in the United States. And we have little control how that seafood is harvested. So there's a rhetorical question. Wouldn't it make more sense to allow U.S. fishermen to sustainably harvest our fish supply to supply the nation's seafood need rather than hurt U.S. fishermen and the fishing communities that they live in? And I might say that is one of the things that we are attempting to do or attempting to start that conversation with this reauthorization. While it may be difficult for other nations to implement a sound fishery management principles, we can attempt to make our U.S. law work better. The discussion draft that we released in December attempts to clarify the roles of the Magnus and Stevens Act in relation to those other U.S. statutes that I mentioned to minimize conflicts for fishermen and for fishery managers. As most of you know, 2014, this year, uh, is an election year. And if you don't know that, I don't know what you've been doing, if you don't know that. And this is 14, not 16, by the way. So our window of moving a complex piece of legislation like this, uh, it, it may be short simply because of the nature of being election season. But having said that, it is my goal as chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee to reauthorize this act in this Congress. And while uh, the time for the reauthorization process is maybe limited, the purpose of releasing the proposed uh, reauthorization as a discussion draft was to allow for a public discussion, review, and a comment. That might have set us back a little bit. 
But as a result, though, we have received a lot of very helpful comments and constructive criticism, which is good. And for those of you that took time to comment, I want to thank you very much for that. And I also want to mention, too, I've also been working uh, very closely with the committee's uh, ranking Democrat, uh, Pete DeFazio from Oregon, to re re further refine the discussion of uh, the pros legislation. I think that we have made positive progress uh, in our discussions, and my goal, obviously, is to continue those converse conversations with Congressman DeFazio. It is my goal uh, for the bill to be considered by the full committee next month in May, and that, of course, will begin the process of moving the bill to the full House and to passage in the House. Now, I understand that Senators Begich and Rubio have also uh, released a draft bill for their, co their public comment. Uh, it, it's, uh, regardless of what's in it, it's good news, and I hope, that, I hope that means that both sides of the Capitol and both sides of the aisle are interested in getting this reauthorization done during this Congress, and I look forward to working with them and with all of you. And as you all know, you can't pass legislation to get to the president's desk unless both houses act. And I suspect, just because the, the nature of the makeup of the U.S. House and the nature of the makeup of the U.S. Senate, that there will be different proposals. I understand that. I accept that. But you can't get something to the president's desk until both houses act. That will give us an opportunity then to go to conference and work out whatever differences we have. So as I said <clears throat> a moment ago, my goal as chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee, notwithstanding the fact that this is my last term, is to reauthorize the act in this Congress, and I certainly hope that we can do that. So uh, if, you have, uh, if we have time here, I'd be more than happy to try to respond to uh, any questions you may have. I can't help the Mariners with their lack of hitting, but uh, <laughs> I can make the observation if nothing else. So but if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to respond. <laughs> So we will hand the live mic to whomever has a question. If uh, you could just state your name, that would be useful. All those in favor? <laughs> John? I've never been accused of being bashful, so I won't be. I'm Wally Pereira, uh, Congressman, thank you very much for coming and presenting us your thoughts. Um, how, how do you see the reconciliation going on between the House draft and the Senate process now? Well, as I said, uh, uh, rarely, rarely does any legislation in either House survive passing that, their respective houses in the initial form. I mean, we've already made changes to our draft. So uh, when we, uh, my hope is obviously to pass legislation out of the House in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, I can only say that I suspect the Senate will be different uh, and I will work as hard as I can obviously to find the common ground. That's the easy part. And then where we have those differences, we'll just have to, to negotiate between the two. But that's the nature of a legislative process. So uh, I, I, I'm not going to comment on, you know, I, I, I'm familiar with our draft. I know our people are looking at their draft to find out what's in it and, and, uh, and, and to see if that actually ends up to be the Senate legislation. We don't know that yet. So it's way premature to say how we're going to work out the differences other than to say the process is important and the process requires both houses to pass a piece of legislation. Well, you're a very good group. Thank well, you very if, much. If I, wish I, I, could, uh, if I, I could ask a question. You mentioned yeah. this uh, sense of strengthening communities. Is that embodied in this notion of flexibility? And yes. then you mentioned ACLs and rebuilding timelines. That, those underpin the sense of strengthening? That, that, that's it. I mean, the, uh, if we heard once, we heard a number of times in the hearings that I alluded to that the, the act works, but we need more flexibility. Uh, I mentioned the data collection specifically with the Red Snapper. There are other issues in, in the Northeast, but there are communities in the Northeast uh, that are heavily impacted by the by their reduced quotas. Uh, I'm not going to get in and say which, who is right or wrong. Obviously, the science has to support that. But I do believe this, very important, that those on the ground are probably better able to make those decisions than those that do not live or, or work in that area. And that's the principle behind the flexibility that we're trying to put in for their respective councils.
Trevor Branch, a professor here in SAFS. And um, my question is, you, you raised the comment about how the Fisheries Act relates to other, act, other pieces of legislation like ESA and the Antiquities Act. Um, I was trying to think of a specific example of how this would work with the changes. So think of seller sea lines and Pollock or perhaps another example let me, let me, let me give how it you, would be different. Let me give you an example not related to, uh, to oceans, mm -hmm. but related. Uh, I, I come from central Washington. You know, we're, I'm far away from the ocean. Uh, most of the stuff you catch is spawned in my area, by the way. I mean, take that. <laughs> so fish have to come back up. But, uh, but the Marine Mammal Protection Act, for example, protects seals. Now, there is a non-indigenous seal from California, California seals, that come up the Columbia River and feast on returning salmon at Bonneville Dam. That's a conflicting uh, issue because you have statutes, you know, here we are trying to protect, quote, an endangered fish uh, like the salmon, and then you have another statute that allows uh, another protected species to feast on that. Uh, there has to be some way to, uh, to work those things out. And I suspect there are probably other examples throughout the ocean, but that's a concrete example here in the Northwest that anybody that follows, follows fishing knows that that happens down at Bonneville Dam. Oh, thanks. Thanks for coming to talk to us today. I'm, I'm Bill Clark. I'm unemployed. Um, <laughs> it's, it well, seems I will that, be at the end of the year, so... <laughs> it, it, it seems that fisheries management has escaped the sort of partisan paralysis that grips Congress in other areas, it, and which I'm glad for. But why is that? How, why, how, what, what do you have to thank for that? Well, let, let me just broaden that question because uh, uh, I, I will say that in my committee, uh, listen, we have partisan differences in, in, in my committee, yet we continue pass out, every time we have a markup and pass bills out of committee, a vast majority, 70, 80 percent of those bills are what we call consent bills, agreeable on both sides. And then we have bills where there's a difference of opinion. Uh, there's no news in agreement. There is only news in disagreement. And so uh, I, I'll be the first to say that uh, the, the two parties have moved farther, uh, you know, in the last 20 years have moved farther away to the left and right. Uh, that's reflected, frankly, in the American people because the country is politically divided. And that's going to show up, obviously, in their elected representatives. So, uh, but having said all of that, uh, I still think the American people think that we should govern regardless of our differences. Put the election aside and govern for a two-year period, then we'll do it all over again. That's the nature of self-government. Self-government was supposed to be hard. That's why, the, that's why our founders divided so much power. I mean, even the legislative branch is divided in two bodies. So you're going to have those differences, but I do want to emphasize the fact that there's no news when there's agreement. There's only news when there's disagreement. And, uh, but I'll, I, I'll, certainly, uh, I'll certainly say that there are partisan differences, no question. But uh, uh, one of the ironies, uh, I won't say the ironies, but uh, the, the area that really needs, uh, in, in terms of Magnus and Stephen, that needs more flexibility is the Northeast. Uh, and I'm a Republican, obviously. Uh, uh, the Democrats in the Northeast are the ones that are looking at us to try to help them, and I, I want to help them. The issue, I think, is more important, but, but in, in the bigger issue, I know I'm repeating myself here, but there's no news in agreement, there's only news in disagreement. That's why you hear it over and over. One, one last question, perhaps? I've so, got somebody back. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. My name is Mike Szymanski. And where, where are I don't. Oh. Oh, over here. Okay, all right, yeah. I, I'm a little guy. Well, no, it's not that I can't see you, it's just the... Uh, no flag. problem. Uh, one of the provisions that you have in your bill that I find uh, progressive thinking, and, and some people may disagree with me on it, but is the provision that basically says that uh, NEPA is met uh, once you've gone through the same parallel process of review and standards and so forth. And I think that's progressive thinking. Uh, how uh, do you think it, it, it's got a chance of getting through as it's drafted? Well, let me say that uh, when I alluded to other groups, they'll use sometimes NEPA as a means to slow down, you know, what's going on, and, and you get redundancy going through all of these uh, regulations. Uh, yes, I mean, I, we, we put it in there with the expectation that it would survive. Now, we're going to have to negotiate. I recognize that. Uh, but I certainly hope that we can put some common sense. I think that's the best way to, to approach that. If you have redundancies and you're not changing, uh, you know, an outcome other than slowing it down, which is not beneficial to the economy or to those that are affected, 
it seems to me that you try to re, you know, eliminate those redundancies or reduce the redundancies, and that's the nature and the reason why we have that in our, our draft discussion. But yes, I prefer to go through life being optimistic, and so I hope that it survives. Well, thank you very much for coming all the way Pleasure. out here, and Bet. another round of applause, please. Thank you all.